So, so I, what I've tried to do, and thank you for all of this, is I've tried to, to put context to the question, PARP yes, no. Once you've decided, whatever the criteria are, PARP yes, no, then you have to make a key second decision, which PARP? And I, and I like to spend a few minutes to talk about that. What is the, Oliver, what's the dominant decision when you make a decision, which PARP? Yeah. So we give me one answer. What's the dominant decision making? Is it is it oh you know niraprib is once daily, or oh I have more experience with elaprib, or oh I like the studies that recaprib are doing, and there are other answers. So to me, it comes down to the experience with the Thank pop you. that I'm okay. using, mm -hmm. because every uh, one of the pops is slightly different, particularly in the side effect profile and mm -hmm. the way you manage the side effects. Um, and therefore, I have a, fa I have a preference. That's a, good, that's a good answer, and thank you for that. Leslie, what's the one, not the one, but what's the most important factor that resonates in your mind as you choose amongst the three PARPs whose mm -hmm. indications are very similar? I think real or perceived toxicity, toxicity, side effect profile. So what would be the more toxic PARP inhibitors? Or let, let, me, let me be the positive. Let me speak mm -hmm. positively rather than negatively. What would be the more tolerable PARP inhibitor? I think you're asking a really difficult question. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to moderate I this. Absolutely. I think, um, I think it's difficult. You know, I'm, I'm glad we have all of them. I'm glad that they all work. Do uh, you have to make I a decision. See? Help us. Which one is the more tolerable in your mind? Which one is the more tolerable in my mind? I can't answer that question. I think that if you know how to manage them, they're all tolerable. You should go into politics. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's, what's the main factor in determining which PARP inhibitor to, to triage to? Um, right now, I, th I do th I agree with Leslie that toxicity is probably the thing that's in the front of the mind. However, you know, for example, niraparib, the thing we worry about is thrombocytopenia. Since they've instituted the weights and plate, but uh, assessment, uh, you're now seeing much lower rates, uh, my understanding is, uh, of grade three thrombocytopenia. So I, I, all the, you know, recaprib, we talk about liver enzyme elevation. Uh, Laprib was GI when we, you know, we're doing the capsules. And, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, what, what, what we really see is if we had any of these drugs and we're comparing them to chemotherapy, all of them have a side effect profile that we could deal with. Mm -hmm. um, frankly, and, and now we're starting to nitpick because whatever is going on with one of the drugs, you have two sales forces out there uh, magnifying those side effects yeah. and talking about them and making them big, probably bigger deals than what they are because if we only had one PARP, any one of these PARPs, we would gladly give and easily manage those side That's effects. Right. So let me just be clear. So in patients that are underweight, maybe less than uh, you know, 170 pounds, mm -hmm and they have a low baseline platelet count, let's say less than 150, should probably be started at 200 once daily rather than 300, that's what you're talking about. Right. Katie, what, what, what is the main factor? I'm beginning, there are lots. What's the main factor in determining which PARP inhibitor to use? For me, um, and I'm, I think like everyone at the table have used all of them and so I'm very comfortable with all of them. Um, for me, it's which one I can get my patient without them having a copay. Huh. I'm going to use whatever one huh. I can get for the patient that doesn't cost her $2,000 a month. So some people have said that because niraparib is the same strength of t capsule, that if they dose reduce, they don't have to pay another copay. Because the best way to avoid it, to, to have a low copay is not to have one. Right. And, and if you have the other PARP inhibitors, you need a different pill strength. You got to do a new prescription. Yeah. And you have to be, you know, and I'm not... I don't think we can use that against them, but it is, it is true. These are expensive drugs. You know, I, I take care of amazing patient population, but I don't have people walking in with just brimming cash that can pay this out of pocket. I have no patient that can pay this out of pocket. So it's incredibly important. I want to use PARPs. I, I mean, I really do want every patient to have access to a PARP, but I don't want them to go into financial ruin for it. So whichever of them has the best so as I surveyed support. the four of you, I'm struck by that, that you, none of you said, oh, I like once daily dosing of a PARP inhibitor. Uh, it's okay, but I, I hear that frequently. I'm going to give you my answer, which is different than the well, four. I think it's label. It's always label, right? But the so, labels have become that's what I'm homogenized. Saying. Right. That's and what, and, and, I do think, and I do think the, the once daily is, is something that needs to be considered because it becomes 
not only convenience, but a compliance issue. That's also true. So here's, uh, you know, how we think about this, and, and I think, and you said the first thing, molecular signature. I think in the highly sensitive patient, the BRCA patient, probably all PARPs have equal efficacy, okay? Because, because they're so sensitive. I think in the molecular signature negative patient, you need the most active PARP. And by active, I mean the highest intracellular level. And by active, I mean that inhibits the uh, PARP trapping and enzymatic uh, inhibition the greatest. And I think as you look at the three PARP inhibitors, there are differences in the volume of distribution and how they respond in vitro to the HRD negative uh, genotype. Mm -hmm. and, and if you say, well, maybe one PARP inhibitor is, is stronger than the other, if you look at the clinical data, you kind of get a hint. So again, that's a, it's an incomplete assessment, but these are the things that I agonize. And quite frankly, I don't really care what patient I give a, with a BRCA mutation, what PARP inhibitor. And they're all gonna work, and I know how to use all three of them, but I agonize in the HRD negative patient, am I gonna use the wrong PARP inhibitor, and she's not gonna have a response because I picked the wrong choice. Does that, is that, is that reasonable, or am I just, uh, and I, I think, Brad, I agree with you. There are uh, some significant pharmacological differences. Yeah. And in, in vivo preclinical models, you do see increased efficacy with nivaparin when you mm -hmm. treat uh, xenograms. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily relate in uh, increased efficacy in patients. So I don't think we have that data yet because we have never compared that. I, well, and we'll never know, right? We'll never compare them. 